Chapter 13 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox. LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 13. Well, I catch my breath and most fainted, shut up on a wreck with such a gang as that. But it weren't no time to be sentimentering. We'd got to find that boat now. Had to have it for ourselves. So we went a quaking and shaking down the starboard side, and slow work it was, too. Seemed a week before we got to the stern. No sign of a boat. Jim said he didn't believe he could go any further. So scared he hadn't hardly any strength left, he said. But I said, come on, if we get left on this wreck, we are in a fix, sure. So on we prowled again. We struck for the stern of the Texas and found it, and then scrabbled along forwards on the skylight, hanging on from shutter to shutter, for the edge of the skylight was in the water. When we got pretty close to the cross-hall door, there was the skiff, sure enough. I could just barely see her. I felt ever so thankful. In another second, I would have been aboard of her, but just then the door opened. One of the men stuck his head out only about a couple of foot from me, and I thought I was gone, but he jerked it in again and says, Heave that blame lantern out of sight, Bill. He flung a bag of something into the boat, and then he got in himself and sat down. It was Packard. Then Bill, he come out and got in. Packard says in a low voice, already shove off i couldn't hardly hang on to the shutters i was so weak but bill says hold on did you go through him no didn't you no so he's got his share of the cash yet well then come along no use to take truck and leave money say won't he suspicion what we're up to maybe he won't but we got to have it anyway come along so they got out and went in the door slammed too because it was on the careen side and in half a second i was in the boat and jim come tumbling after me i out with my knife and cut the rope and away we went we didn't touch an oar and we didn't speak nor whisper nor hardly even breathe we went gliding swift along dead silent past the tip of the paddle box and past the stern then in a second or two more we was a hundred yards below the wreck and the darkness soaked her up every last sign of her and we was safe and knowed it when we was three or four hundred yards downstream we see the lantern show like a little spark at the texas door for a second and we knowed by that that the rascals had missed their boat and was beginning to understand that they was in just as much trouble now as jim turner was then jim manned the oars and we took out after our raft now was the first time that i begun to worry about the men i reckon i hadn't had time to before I begun to think how dreadful it was, even for murderers, to be in such a fix. I says to myself, there ain't no telling, but I might come to be a murderer myself yet, and then how would I like it? So I says to Jim, the first light we see, we'll land a hundred yards below it or above it, in a place where it's a good hiding place for you and the skiff, and then I'll go fix up some kind of yarn and get somebody to go for that gang and get them out of their scrape so they can be hung when their time comes. But that idea was a failure, for pretty soon it begun to storm again, and this time worse than ever. The rain poured down and never a light showed everybody in bed i reckon we boomed along down the river watching for lights and watching for our raft after a long time the rain let up but the clouds stayed and the lightning kept whimpering and by and by a flash showed us a black thing ahead floating and we made for it it was the raft and mighty glad was we to get aboard it again we seen a light now way down to the right on shore, so I said I would go for it. The skiff was half full of plunder, which that gang had stole there on the wreck. We hustled it onto the raft in a pile, and I told Jim to float along down and show a light when he judged he had gone about two mile, and keep it burning till I come. Then I manned my oars and shoved for the light. As I got down towards it, three or four more showed up on a hillside it was a village i closed in above the shore light and laid on my oars and floated as i went by i see it was a lantern hanging on the jackstaff of a double hull ferry boat i skimmed around for the watchman a wondering whereabouts he slept and by and by i found him roosting on the bits forward with his head down between his knees 
I gave his shoulder two or three little shoves and begun to cry. He stirred up in kind of a startlish way, but when he see it was only me, he took a good gap and stretch, and then he says, Hello, what's up? Don't cry, bub. What's the trouble? I says, Pap and ma'am and sis, and, and then I broke down. He says, Oh, dang it now, don't take on so. We all has to have our troubles, and this one'll come out all right. What's the matter with them? There, there, are you the watchman of the boat? Yes, he says, kind of pretty well satisfied like. I'm the captain and the owner and the mate and the pilot and the watchman and the deckhand, and sometimes I'm the freight and the passengers. I ain't as rich as old Jim Hornback, and I can't be so blame generous and good to Tom, Dick, and Harry as what he is, and slam around money the way he does, but I've told him many a time, and I wouldn't trade places with him for, says I, a sailor's life's the life for me, and I'm darned if I'd live two miles out of town where there ain't nothing ever going on, not for all his spondulics and as much more on top of it. Says I, I broke in and says, they're in an awful peck of trouble, and who is? Why, Pap and Ma'am and Sis and Miss Hooker, and if you'd take your ferry boat and go up there. Up where? Where are they? On the wreck. What wreck? Why, there ain't but one. What, don't you mean the Walter Scott? Yes. Good land, what are they doing there, for gracious sakes? Well, they didn't go there a purpose. I bet they didn't. Why, great goodness, there ain't no chance for them if they don't get off mighty quick. Why, how in the nation did they ever get into such a scrape? Easy enough, Miss Hooker was a visiting up there to the town. Yes, Booth's Landing, go on. She was a visiting there at Booth's Landing, and just in the edge of the evening, she started over with her nigger woman and the horse ferry to stay out all night at her friend's house, Miss What You May Call Her, I disremember her name. And they lost their steering oar and swung around and went a floating down stern first about two miles, saddlebags on the wreck, and the ferryman and the nigger woman and the horses was all lost. But Miss Hooker, she made a grab and got aboard the wreck. Well, about an hour after dark, we come along down in our trading scow, and it was so dark we didn't notice the wreck till we was right on it, so we saddle bagsed. But all of us was saved but Bill Whipple, and oh, he was the best creature. I most wish it had been me, I do. My George, that's the beatinest thing I ever struck. And then what did you all do? Well, we hollered and took on, but it's so wide there we couldn't make nobody hear. So Pap and somebody got to get ashore and get help somehow. I was the only one that could swim, so I made a dash for it. Miss Hooker, she said if I didn't strike help sooner, come here and hunt up her uncle and he'd fix the thing. I made the land about a mile below and been fooling along ever since, trying to get people to do something. But they said, what, in such a night, in such a current, there ain't no sense in it. Go for the steam ferry. Now, if you'll go and buy Jackson, I'd like to, and blame it, I don't know, but I will. But who in the ding nation's going to pay for it? Do you reckon your pap? Why, that's all right. Miss Hooker, she told me particular that her uncle Hornback. Great guns, is he her uncle? Looky here, you break for that light over yonder and turn west when you get there. About a quarter of a mile, you'll come to the tavern. Tell him to dart you out to Jim Hornback's and he'll foot the bill. And don't fool around any because he'll want to know the news. Tell him I'll have his niece all safe before he can get to town. Hump yourself now. I'm going around this corner here to roust out my engineer. I struck out for the light, but as soon as he turned the corner, I went back and got into my skiff and bailed her out, then pulled up shore in the easy water about 600 yards and tucked myself in among some wood boats, for I couldn't rest easy till I could see the ferry boat start. But take it all around, I was feeling rather comfortable on accounts of taking all this trouble for that gang, for not many would have done it. I wish the widow knowed about it. I judged she would be proud of me for helping these rapscallions, because rapscallions and deadbeats is the kind the widow and good people takes the most interest in. Well, before long, here comes the wreck, dim and dusky, sliding along down. A kind of cold shiver went through me, and then I struck out for her. She was very deep, and I see in a minute there weren't much chance for anybody being alive in her. I pulled all around her and hollered a little, but there wasn't any answer. All dead still. I felt a bit heavy-hearted about the gang, but not much, for I reckon if they could stand it, I could. Then here comes the ferry boat, so I shoved for the middle of the river on a long downstream slant, and when I judged I was out of eye reach, I laid on my oars and looked back to see her go and smell around the wreck for Miss Hooker's remainders, because the captain would know her Uncle Hornback would want them, 
and then pretty soon the ferry boat give it up and went for the shore, and I laid into my work and went a-booming down the river. It did seem a powerful long time before Jim's light showed up, and when it did show, it looked like it was a thousand mile off. By the time I got there, the sky was beginning to get a little gray in the east, so we struck for an island and hid the raft and sunk the skiff and turned in and slept like dead people. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 14 by and by when we got up we turned over the truck the gang had stole off the wreck and found boots and blankets and clothes and all sorts of other things and a lot of books and a spyglass and three boxes of cigars we had never been this rich before in neither of our lives the cigars was prime we laid off all afternoon in the woods talking and me reading books and having a general good time I told Jim all about what happened inside the wreck and at the ferry boat, and I said these kinds of things was adventures, but he said he didn't want no more adventures. He said that when I went in the Texas and he crawled back to get on the raft and found her gone, he nearly died, because he judged it was all up with him any way it could be fixed, for if he didn't get saved, he would get drowned, and if he did get saved, whoever saved him would send him back home so as to get the reward, and then Miss Watson would sell him south shore. Well, he was right. He was most always right. He had an uncommon level head for a nigger. I read considerable to Jim about kings and dukes and earls and such, and how gaudy they dressed, and how much style they put on, and called each other your majesty and your grace and your lordship, and so on, instead of mister. And Jim's eyes bugged out, and he was interested. He says, I didn't know there was so many on em. I ain't heard about none of em, scarcely but old King Solomon, unless you counts them kings to send a pack of cards. How much do a king get? get i says why they get a thousand dollars a month if they want it they can have just as much as they want everything belongs to them ain't that gay and what they got to do huck they don't do nothing why how you talk they just sit around no is that so a course it is they just sit around except maybe when there's a war then they go to the war but other times they just lazy around or go hawking just hawking and sp Shh. Did you hear a noise? We skipped out and looked, but it weren't nothing but the flutter of a steamboat's wheel away down, coming around the point. So we come back. Yes, yeah, says I, and other times when things is dull, they fuss with the parliament, and if everybody don't go just so, he whacks their heads off, but mostly they hang around the harem. Round to which? Harem. What's the harem? the place where he keeps his wives. Don't you know about the harem? Solomon had one. He had about a million wives. Why, yes, that's so. I, I done forgot it. A harem's a boarding house, I reckon. Most likely they has rackety times in the nursery, and I reckon the wives quarrels considerable, and that creates the racket. Yet they say Solomon the wisest man that ever lived. I don't take no stock in that, because why? Would a wise man want to live in the midst of such a blim blamming all the time? No, deed he wouldn't. A wise man had taken Bill a biler factory, and then he could shut down the biler factory when he want to rest. Well, but he was the wisest man anyway, because the widder she told me so her own self. I don't care what the widder say, he weren't no wise man nother. He had some of the dad fetchingest ways I ever see. Did you know about that child that he was going to chop in two? Yes, the widder told me all about it. Well, then, wasn't that the beatinest notion in the world? You just take and look at it a minute. There's the stump. There, that's one of the women. Here's you. That's the other one. I Solomon. And this year, Dollar Bill's the child. Both of you claims it. What does I do? Does I shin around amongst the neighbors and find out which of you the bill belongs to and hand it over to the right one, all safe and sound, the way that anybody that had any gumption would? 
No, I take and whack the bill in two and give half on it to you and the other half to the other woman. That's the way Solomon was going to do with the child. Now I want to ask you, what's the use in half a bill? Can't buy nothing with it. In what use is half a child? I wouldn't give a darn for a million of them. But hang it, Jim, you've clean missed the point. Blame it, you missed it by a thousand mile. Who, me? Go long. Don't talk to me about your pints. I reckon I know sense when I sees it, and there ain't no sense in such doings as that. Dispute won't bout half a child. Dispute bout a whole child. And the man that think he can settle a dispute bout a whole child with a half a child don't know enough to come in out the rain. Don't talk to me about Solomon, Hulk. I knows him by the back. But I tell you, you don't get the point. Blame the point. I reckon I knows what I knows. And mind you, the real pine is down further. It's down deeper. It lays in the way Solomon was raised. You take a man that's got only one or two children. Is that man going to be wasteful of children? No, he ain't. He can't afford it. He knows how to value them. But you take a man that's got about five million children running around the house and it's different. He as soon chop a child in two as a cat. There's plenty more. A child or two more or less won't no consequence to Solomon. Dad fetch him. I never seen such a nigger. If he got a notion in his head once, there weren't no getting it out again. He was the most down on Solomon of any nigger I ever see. So I went to talking about other kings and let Solomon slide. I told about Louis XVI that got his head cut off in France long time ago, and about his little boy, the Dolphin, that would have been a king, but they took and shut him up in jail, and some say he died there. Poor little chap. But some says he got out and got away and come to America. That's good, but he'll be pretty lonesome. There ain't no kings here, is they, Huck? Nope. Then he can't get no situation. What he going to do? Well, I don't know. Some of them gets on the police, and some of them learns people how to talk French. Why, Huck, don't the French people talk the same way we does? No, Jim, you couldn't understand a word they said, not a single word. Well, now, I be ding busted. How did that come? I don't know, but it's so. I got some of their jabber out of a book. Suppose a man was to come to you and say, Polly Vu Franzi, what would you think? I wouldn't think nothing. I'd take him bust him over the head, that is, if he weren't white. I wouldn't allow no nigger to call me that. Shucks, it ain't calling you anything. It's only saying, do you know how to talk French? Well, then, why couldn't he say it? Why, he is a saying it. That's a Frenchman's way of saying it. Well, it's a brain ridiculous way, and I don't want to hear no more about it. There ain't no sense in it. Look here, Jim. Does a cat talk like we do? No, a cat don't. Well, does a cow? No, a cow don't nother. Does a cat talk like a cow, or a cow talk like a cat? No, they don't. It's natural and right for them to talk different from each other, ain't it? Course. And ain't it natural and right for a cat and a cow to talk different from us? Why, most surely it is. Well then, why ain't it natural and right for a Frenchman to talk different from us? You answer me that. Is a cat a man, Huck? No. Well, then, there ain't no sense in a cat talking like a man. Is a cow a man, or is a cow a cat? No, she ain't either of them. Well, then, she ain't got no business to talk like either one or the other of them. Is a Frenchman a man? Yes. Well, then, Dad, blame it. Why don't he talk like a man? You answer me that. I see it weren't no use wasting words. You can't learn a nigga to argue. So I quit. End of chapter 14、Chapter 15 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 15. We judged that three nights more would fetch us to Cairo, at the bottom of Illinois, where the Ohio River comes in, and that was what we was after. We would sell the raft and get on a steamboat and go way up the Ohio, amongst the free states, and then be out of trouble. Well, the second night, a fog began to come on, and we made for a towhead to tie to, for it wouldn't do to try to run in a fog. 
but when I paddled ahead in the canoe with the line to make fast, there weren't anything but little saplings to tie to. I passed the line around one of them right on the edge of the cut bank, but there was a stiff current, and the raft come booming down so lively she tore it out by the roots, and away she went. I see the fog closing down, and it made me so sick and scared I couldn't budge for most half a minute, it seemed to me, and then there weren't no raft in sight. You couldn't see twenty yards. I jumped into the canoe and run back to the stern and grabbed the paddle and set her back a stroke, but she didn't come. I was in such a hurry I hadn't untied her. I got up and tried to untie her, but I was so excited my hands shook, so I couldn't hardly do anything with them. As soon as I got started, I took out after the raft, hot and heavy, right down the towhead. That was all right as far as it went, but the towhead weren't sixty yards long, and the minute I flew by the foot of it, I shot out into the solid white fog and had no more idea which way I was going than a dead man. Thinks I, it won't do to paddle. First, I know I'll run into the bank or a towhead or something. I got to set still and float, and yet it's mighty fidgety business to have to hold your hand still at such a time. I whooped and listened. Away down there somewheres, I hears a small whoop, and up comes my spirits. I went tearing after it, listening sharp to hear it again. The next time it come, I see I weren't heading for it, but heading away to the right of it. And the next time, I was heading away to the left of it, and not gaining on it much either, for I was flying around this way and that and the other, but it was going straight ahead all the time. I did wish the fool would think to beat a tin pan and beat it all the time, but he never did, and it was the still places between the hoops that was making the trouble for me. Well, I fought along, and directly I hears the whoop behind me. I was tangled good now. That was somebody else's whoop, or else I was turned around. I throwed the paddle down. I heard the whoop again. It was behind me yet, but in a different place. It kept coming and kept changing its place, and I kept answering till by and by it was in front of me again, and I knowed the current had swung the canoe's head downstream, and I was all right if that was Jim and not some other raftsman hollering. I couldn't tell nothing about voices in a fog, for nothing don't look natural nor sound natural in a fog. The whooping went on, and in about a minute, I come a-booming down on a cut bank with smoky ghosts of big trees on it, and the current throwed me off to the left and shot by amongst a lot of snags that fairly roared the current was tearing by them so swift. In another second or two, it was solid white and still again. I sat perfectly still then, listening to my heart thump, and I reckon I didn't draw a breath while it thumped a hundred. I'd just give up then. I knowed what the matter was. That cut bank was an island, and Jim had gone down to the other side of it. It warn't no towhead that you could float by in ten minutes. It had the big timber of a regular island. It might be five or six miles long and more than half a mile wide. I kept quiet, with my ears cocked about fifteen minutes, I reckon. I was floating along, of course, four or five miles an hour, but you don't ever think of that. No, you feel like you're laying dead still on the water. And if a little glimpse of a snag slips by you, you don't think to yourself how fast you're going, but you catch your breath and think, my, how that snag's tearing along. If you think it ain't dismal and lonesome out in the fog that way by yourself in the night, you try it once. You'll see. Next, for about a half an hour, I whoops now and then, and at last I hears the answer a long ways off and tries to follow it, but I couldn't do it. And directly, I judged I got into a nest of towheads, for I had little dim glimpses of them on both sides of me, sometimes just a narrow channel in between, and some that I couldn't see I knowed was there because I'd hear the wash of the current against the old dead brush and trash that hung over the banks. Well, I weren't long losing the whoops down amongst the towheads, and I only tried to chase them a little while anyway because it was worse than chasing a jack-o'-lantern. You never know to sound dodge around so and swap places so quick and so much. I had to claw away from the bank pretty lively four or five times to keep from knocking the islands out of the river, and so I judged the raft must be buttoned into the bank every now and then, or else it would get further ahead and clear out of hearing. It was floating a little faster than I was. 
Well, I seemed to be in the open river again by and by, but I couldn't hear no sign of a whoop nowheres. I reckon Jim had fetched up on a snag, maybe, and it was all up with him. I was good and tired, so I laid down in the canoe and said I wouldn't bother no more. I didn't want to go to sleep, of course, but I was so sleepy I couldn't help it, so I thought I would just take one little cat nap. But I reckon it was more than a cat nap, for when I waked up, the stars was shining bright, and the fog was all gone, and I was spinning down a big bend, stern first. First, I didn't know where I was. I thought I was dreaming, and when things began to come back to me, they seemed to come up dim out of last week. It was a monstrous big river here with the tallest and thickest kind of timber on both banks, just a solid wall as well as I could see by the stars. I looked away downstream and seen a black speck on the water. I took after it, but when I got to it, it weren't nothing but a couple of saw logs made fast together. Then I see another speck and chase that, then another, and this time I was right. It was the raft. When I got to it, Jim was sitting there with his head down between his knees, asleep, with his right arm hanging over the steering oar. The other oar was smashed off, and the raft was littered up with leaves and branches and dirt, so she'd had a rough time. I made fast and laid down under Jim's nose on the raft and began to gap and stretch my fist out against Jim and says, Hello, Jim. Have I been asleep? Why didn't you stir me up? Goodness gracious, is that you, Huck? And you ain't dead? You ain't drowned? You's back again? It's too good for true, honey. It's too good for true. Let me look at you, child. Let me feel of you. Oh, you ain't dead. You's back again. Live and sound. Just the same old Huck. The same old Huck. Thanks to goodness. What's the matter with you, Jim? You been a-drinkin'? Drinkin'? Has I been a-drinkin'? Has I had a chance to be a-drinkin'? Well, then, what makes you talk so wild? How does I talk wild? How? Why, ain't you been talking about my comin' back and all that stuff as if I'd been gone away? Huck. Huck Finn, you look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. Hain't you been gone away? Gone away? Why, what in the nation do you mean? I ain't been gone anywheres. Where would I go to? Well, looky here, boss. There's something wrong there is. Is I me or who is I? Is I here or where is I? Now that's what I wants to know. Well, I think you're here plain enough, but I think you're a tangle-headed old fool, Jim. I is, is I? Well, you answer me this. Didn't you tow out the line in the canoe for to make fast on the tow head? No, I didn't. What tow head? I ain't seen no tow head. You ain't seen no tow head. Looky here, didn't the line pull loose and the raft go a humming down the river and leave you in the canoe behind in the fog? What fog? Why, the fog, the fog that's been round all night. And didn't you whoop, and didn't I whoop till we got mixed up in the islands, and one of us got lost, and the other was just as good as lost, cause he didn't know where he was? And didn't I bust up again a lot in them islands, and have a terrible time, and most get drowned? Now ain't that so, boss, ain't it so? You answer me that. Well, this is too many for me, Jim. I ain't seen no fog, nor no islands, nor no troubles, nor nothing. I've been sitting here talking with you all night till you went to sleep about ten minutes ago, and I reckon I'd done the same. You couldn't have got drunk in that time, so of course you've been dreaming. Dad, fetch it. How's I going to dream all dad in ten minutes? Well, hanging all, you did dream it, because there didn't any of it happen. But, hog. Huh. It's all just as plain to me as it don't make no difference how plain it is. There ain't nothing in it. I know because I've been here all the time. Jim didn't say nothing for about five minutes, but sat there studying over it. Then he says, Well, then, I reckon I did dream it, Huck, but dogs my cats if it ain't the powerfulest dream I ever see. And I ain't ever had no dream before that's tired me like this one. Oh, well, that's all right, because a dream does tire a body like everything sometimes. But this one was a staving dream. Tell me about it, Jim. So Jim went to work and told me the whole thing right through, just as it happened. Only he painted it up considerable. Then he said he must start and interpret it, because it was sent for a warning. He said the first towhead stood for a man that would try to do us some good, but the current was another man that would get us away from him. The whoops was warnings that would come to us every now and then. 
and if we didn't try hard to make out to understand them, they'd just take us into bad luck instead of keeping us out of it. The lot of towheads was troubles we was going to get into with quarrelsome people and all kinds of mean folks. But if we minded our business and didn't talk back and aggravate them, we would pull through and get out of the fog and into the big clear river, which was the free states, and wouldn't have no more trouble. It had clouded up pretty dark just after I got onto the raft, but it was clearing up again now. Oh, well, that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes, Jim, I says. But what does these things stand for? It was the leaves and rubbish on the raft and the smashed oar. You could see them first rate now. Jim looked at the trash and then looked at me and back at the trash again. He had got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into its place again right away. But when he did get the thing straightened around, he looked at me steady without ever smiling and says, What do they stand for? I's going to tell you. When I got all wore out with work and with the calling for you and went to sleep, my heart was most broke because you was lost and I didn't care no more what become of me in the raft. And when I wake up and find you back again all safe and sound, the tears come and I could have got down on my knees and kissed your foot. I was so thankful. And all you was thinking about was how could you make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck there is trash and trash is what people is that puts dirt on the head of their friends and make them ashamed. Then he got up slow and walked to the wigwam, and went in there without saying anything but that. But that was enough. It made me feel so mean I could almost kiss his foot to get him to take it back. It was fifteen minutes before I could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger, but I'd done it, and I weren't ever sorry for it afterwards neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't have done that one if I'd have knowed it would make him feel that way. End of chapter 15、Chapter、16 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 16. We slept most all day and started out at night, a little ways behind a monstrous long raft. That was as long going by as a procession. She had four long sweeps at each end, so we judged she carried as many as thirty men, likely. She had five big wigwams aboard, wide apart, and an open camp fire in the middle, and a tall flagpole at each end. There was a power of style about her. It amounted to something being a raftsman on such a craft as that. We went drifting down into a big bend, and the night clouded up and got hot. The river was very wide and was walled with solid timber on both sides. You couldn't see a break in it hardly ever or a light. We talked about Cairo and wondered whether we would know it when we got to it. I said likely we wouldn't, because I had heard say there weren't but about a dozen houses there, and if they didn't happen to have them lit up, how was we going to know we was passing a town? Jim said the two big rivers joined together there. That would show. But I said maybe we might think we was passing the foot of an island. And coming into the same old river again. That disturbed Jim and me too. So the question was what to do. I said, paddle ashore the first time a light showed, and tell them Pap was behind, coming along with a trading scow, and was a green hand at the business, and wanted to know how far it was to Cairo. Jim thought it was a good idea. So we took a smoke on it and waited. 
there weren't nothing to do now but to look out sharp for the town and not pass it without seeing it he said he'd be mighty sure to see it because he'd be a free man the minute he seen it but if he missed it he'd be in a slave country again and no more show for freedom every little while he jumps up and says da she is but it weren't it was jack-o'-lanterns or lightning bugs so he sat down again and went to watching same as before jim said it made him all over trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom well i can tell you it made me all over trembly and feverish too to hear him because i begun to get it through my head that he was most free and who was to blame for it why me i couldn't get that out of my conscience no how nor no way it got to troubling me so i couldn't rest i couldn't stay still in one place it hadn't ever come home to me before what this thing was that i was doing but now it did and it stayed with me and scorched me more and more i tried to make out to myself that i warn't to blame because i didn't run jim off from his rightful owner but it warn't no use conscience up and says every time but you knowed he was running for his freedom and you could a paddled ashore and told somebody that was so i couldn't get around that no way that was where it pinched conscience says to me what had poor miss watson done to you that you could see her nigger go off right under your eyes and never say one single word what did that poor old woman do to you that you could treat her so mean why she tried to learn you your book she tried to learn you your manners she tried to be good to you every way she knowed how that's what she done i got to feeling so mean and so miserable i almost wished i was dead i fidgeted up and down the raft abusing myself to myself and jim was fidgeting up and down past me we neither of us could keep still every time he danced around and says does cairo it went through me like a shot and i thought if it was cairo i reckoned i would die of miserableness jim talked out loud all the time while i was talking to myself he was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent and when he got enough he would buy his wife which was owned on a farm close to where miss watson lived and then they would both work to buy the two children and if their master wouldn't sell them they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them it most froze me to hear such talk he wouldn't ever dared to talk such talk in his life before just see what a difference it made in him the minute he judged he was about free it was according to the old saying give a nigger an inch and he'll take an l thinks i this is what comes of my not thinking here was this nigger which i had as good as help to run away coming right out flat-footed and saying he would steal his children children that belonged to a man i didn't even know a man that hadn't ever done me no harm i was sorry to hear jim say that it was such a lowering of him my conscience got to stirring me up hotter than ever till at last i says to it let up on me it ain't too late yet i'll paddle ashore at the first light and tell i felt easy and happy and light as a feather right off all my troubles was gone i went to looking out sharp for a light and sort of singing to myself by and by one showed jim sings out 
We's safe, Huck, we's safe. Jump up and crack your heels. Dat's de good old Cairo at last. I just knows it. I says, I'll take the canoe and go and see Jim. It mightn't be, you know. He jumped and got the canoe ready and put his old coat in the bottom for me to set on and give me the paddle, and as I shoved off, he says, Pretty soon I'll be a shoutin' for joy, and I'll say it's all on accounts of Huck. I's a free man, and I couldn't ever been free if it hadn't been for Huck. Huck done it. Jim won't ever forget you, Huck. You's de best friend Jim's ever had, and you's de only friend old Jim's got now. I was paddling off, all in a sweat to tell on him. But when he says this, it seemed to kind of take the tuck all out of me. I went along slow then, and I warn't right down certain whether I was glad I started or whether I warn't. When I was fifty yards off, Jim says, "'Dow you goes, de old true huck, de only white gentleman that ever kept his promise to old Jim. Well, I just felt sick but I says, I got to do it. I can't get out of it. Right then, along comes a skiff with two men in it with guns, and they stopped, and I stopped. One of them says, what's that yonder? A piece of a raft, I says. Do you belong on it? Yes, sir. Any men on it? Only one, sir. Well, there's five niggers run off tonight up yonder, above the head of the bend, is your man white or black? I didn't answer up prompt. I tried to, but the words wouldn't come. I tried for a second or two to brace up and out with it, but I warn't man enough. Hadn't the spunk of a rabbit. I see I was weakening, so I just give up trying, and up and says, he's white. I reckon we'll go and see for ourselves. I wish you would, says I, because it's pap that's there, and maybe you'd help me tow the raft ashore where the light is. He's sick, and so is ma'am and Marianne. Oh, the devil, we're in a hurry, boy, but I suppose we've got to. Come, buckle to your paddle, and let's get along. I buckled to my paddle, and they laid to their oars. When we had made a stroke or two, I says, Pap'll be mighty much obliged to you, I can tell you. Everybody goes away when I want them to help me tow the raft ashore, and I can't do it by myself. Well, that's infernal mean. Odd, too. Say, boy, what's the matter with your father? It's the, um, the, well, it ain't anything much. They stopped pulling. It weren't but a mighty little ways to the raft now. One says, Boy, that's a lie. What is the matter with your pap? Answer up square now, and it'll be the better for you. I will, sir, I will, honest, but don't leave us, please. It's the, the, gentleman, if you'll only pull ahead and let me heave you the headline, you won't have to come a near the raft. Please do. Set her back, John, set her back, says one. They backed water. Keep away, boy keep to lord confound it i just expect the wind has blowed it to us your pap's got the smallpox and you know it precious well why didn't you come out and say so do you want to spread it all over well says i a blubbering i've told everybody before and they just went away and left us poor devil there's something in that we are right down sorry for you but we well, hang it, we don't want the smallpox, you see. Look here, I'll tell you what to do. Don't you try to land by yourself, or you'll smash everything to pieces. You float down about twenty miles, and you'll come to a town on the left-hand side of the river. It will be long after sun-up then, and when you ask for help, you tell them your folks are all down with chills and fever. Don't be a fool again, and let people guess what is the matter. Now we're trying to do you a kindness, 
so you just put twenty miles between us that's a good boy it wouldn't do any good to land yonder where the light is it's only a woodyard say i reckon your father's poor and i'm bound to say he's in pretty hard luck here i'll put a twenty-dollar gold piece on this board and you get it when it floats by i feel mighty mean to leave you but my kingdom it won't do to fool with smallpox don't you see hold on parker says the other man here's a twenty to put on the board for me good-bye boy you do as mr parker told you and you'll be all right that's so my boy good-bye good-bye if you see any runaway niggers you get help and nab them and you can make some money by it good-bye sir says i i won't let no runaway niggers get by me if i can help it they went off and i got aboard the raft feeling bad and low because i knowed very well i had done wrong and i see it weren't no use for me to try to learn to do right a body that don't get started right when he's little ain't got no show when the pinch comes there ain't nothin to back him up and keep him to his work and so he gets beat then i thought a minute and says to myself hold on suppose you'd a done right and give jim up would you felt better than what you do now no says i i'd feel bad i'd feel just the same way i do now well then says i what's the use you learning to do right when it's troublesome to do right and ain't no trouble to do wrong and the wages is just the same i was stuck i couldn't answer that so i reckoned i wouldn't bother no more about it but after this always do whichever come handiest at the time i went into the wigwam jim weren't there i looked all around he weren't anywhere i says jim here i is huck is day out of sight yet don't talk loud he was in the river under the stern oar with just his nose out i told him they were out of sight so he come aboard he says i was a listenin to all de talk and i slips into the river and was gwen to shove for show if they come aboard den i was gwen to swim to dat raff again when dey was gone but lazy how you did fool em huck dat was de smartest dodge i tell you chile i speck it save old jim old jim ain't goin to forget you for dat honey then we talked about the money it was a pretty good raise twenty dollars apiece jim said we could take deck passage on a steamboat now and the money would last us as far as we wanted to go in the free states he said twenty mile more weren't far for the raft to go but he wished he was already there towards daybreak we tied up and jim was mighty particular about hiding the raft good then he worked all day fixing things in bundles and getting all ready to quit rafting that night about ten we hove in sight of the lights of a town away down in a left-hand bend i went off in the canoe to ask about it pretty soon i found a man out in the river with a skiff setting a trot line i ranged up and says mister is that town cairo cairo no you must be a blame fool what town is it mister if you want to know go and find out if you stay here botherin around me for about a half a minute longer you'll get something you won't want i paddled to the raft jim was awful disappointed but i said never mind cairo would be the next place i reckoned we passed another town before daylight and i was going out again but it was high ground so i didn't go no high ground about cairo jim said i had forgot it we laid up for the day on a towhead tolerable close to the left-hand bank i begun to suspicion something so did jim i says maybe we went by cairo in the fog that night he says doin let's talk about it huck 
po niggers can't have no luck i allus spected dat rattlesnake skin weren't done wid its work i wish i'd never seen that snake skin jim i do wish i'd never laid eyes on it it ain't your fault huck you didn't know don't you blame yourself bout it when it was daylight here was the clear ohio water in shore sure enough and outside was the old regular muddy so it was all up with cairo we talked it all over it wouldn't do to take the shore we couldn't take the raft up the stream of course there weren't no way but to wait for dark and start back in the canoe and take the chances so we slept all day amongst the cottonwood thicket so as to be fresh for the work and when we went back to the raft about dark the canoe was gone we didn't say a word for a good while there weren't anything to say we both knowed well enough it was some more work of the rattlesnake skin so what was the use to talk about it it would only look like we was finding fault and that would be bound to fetch more bad luck and keep on fetching it too till we knowed enough to keep still by and by we talked about what we better do and found there weren't no way but just to go along down with the raft till we got a chance to buy a canoe to go back in we weren't going to borrow it when there weren't anybody around the way pap would do for that might set people after us so we shoved out after dark on the raft anybody that don't believe yet that it's foolishness to handle a snakeskin after all that snakeskin done for us will believe it now if they read on and see what more it done for us the place to buy canoes is off of rafts laying up at shore but we didn't see no rafts laying up so we went along during three hours and more well the night got gray and rather thick which is the next meanest thing to fog you can't tell the shape of the river and you can't see no distance it got to be very late and still and then along comes a steamboat up the river we lit the lantern and judged she would see it upstream boats didn't generally come close to us they go out and follow the bars and hunt for easy water under the reefs but nights like this they bull right up the channel against the whole river we could hear her pounding along but we didn't see her good till she was close she aimed right for us often they do that and try to see how close they can come without touching sometimes the wheel bites off a sweep and then the pilot sticks his head out and laughs and thinks he's mighty smart well here she comes and we said she was going to try and shave us but she didn't seem to be shearing off a bit she was a big one and she was coming in a hurry too looking like a black cloud with rows of glowworms around it but all of a sudden she bulged out big and scary with a long row of wide open furnace doors shining like red-hot teeth and her monstrous bows and guards hanging right over us there was a yell at us and a jingling of bells to stop the engines a pow-wow of cussing and whistling of steam and as jim went overboard on one side and i on the other she comes smashing straight through the raft i dived and i aimed to find the bottom too for a thirty-foot wheel had got to go over me and i wanted it to have plenty of room i could always stay under water a minute this time i reckon i stayed under a minute and a half then i bounced for the top in a hurry for i was nearly busting i popped out to my armpits and blowed the water out of my nose and puffed a bit of course there was a booming current and of course that boat started her engines again ten seconds after she stopped them for they never cared much for raftsmen so now she was churning along up the river out of sight in the thick weather though i could hear her 
I sung out for Jim about a dozen times, but I didn't get any answer, so I grabbed a plank that touched me while I was treading water and struck out for shore, shoving it ahead of me. But I made out to see that the drift of the current was towards the left-hand shore, which meant that I was in a crossing, so I changed off and went that way. It was one of these long, slanting, two-mile crossings, so I was a good long time in getting over. I made a safe landing and clumb up the bank. I couldn't see but a little ways, but I went poking along over rough ground for a quarter of a mile or more, and then I run across a big, old-fashioned, double log house before I noticed it. I was going to rush by and get away, but a lot of dogs jumped out and went to howling and barking at me, and I knowed better than to move another peg. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 17. In about a minute, somebody spoke out of a window without putting his head out and says, Be done, boys. Who's there? I says, it's me. Who's me? George Jackson, sir. What do you want? I don't want nothing, sir. I only want to go along by, but the dogs won't let me. What are you prowling around here this time of night for, eh? I weren't prowling around, sir. I fell overboard off of the steamboat. Oh, you did, did you? Strike a light there, somebody. What did you say your name was? George Jackson, sir. I'm only a boy. Look here, if you're telling the truth, you needn't be afraid. Nobody'll hurt you. But don't try to budge. Stand right where you are. Rouse out Bob and Tom, some of you, and fetch the guns. George Jackson, is there anybody with you? No, sir, nobody. I heard the people stirring around in the house now, and see a light. The man sung out. Snatch that light away, Betsy, you old fool. Ain't you got any sense? Put it on the floor behind the front door. Bob, if you and Tom are ready, take your places. All ready. Now, George Jackson, do you know the Shepherdsons? No, sir, I never heard of them. Well, that may be so, and it mayn't. Now, all ready. Step forward, George Jackson, and mind, don't you hurry. Come mighty slow. If there's anybody with you, let him keep back. If he shows himself, he'll be shot. Come along now. Come slow. Push the door open yourself. Just enough to squeeze in. Do you hear? I didn't hurry. I couldn't if I'd a-wanted to. I took one slow step at a time, and there warn't a sound. Only I thought I could hear my heart. The dogs were as still as the humans, but they followed a little behind me. When I got to the three log doorsteps, I heard them unlocking and unbarring and unbolting. I put my hand on the door and pushed it a little and a little more till somebody said, There, that's enough. Put your head in. I done it, but I judged they would take it off. The candle was on the floor, and there they all was looking at me and me at them for about a quarter of a minute. Three big men with guns pointed at me, which made me wince, I tell you. The oldest, gray and about sixty, the other two, thirty or more, all of them fine and handsome, and the sweetest old gray-headed lady, and back of her two young women, which I couldn't see right well. The old gentleman says, There, I reckon it's all right. Come in. As soon as I was in, the old gentleman he locked the door and barred it and bolted it and told the young men to come in with their guns and they all went in a big parlor that had a new rag carpet on the floor and got together in a corner that was out of the range of the front windows. 
there warn't none on the side they held the candle and took a good look at me and all said why he ain't a shepherdson no there ain't any shepherdson about him then the old man said he hoped i wouldn't mind being searched for arms because he didn't mean no harm by it it was only to make sure so he didn't pry into my pockets but only felt outside with his hands and said it was all right he told me to make myself easy and at home and tell all about myself but the old lady says why bless you saul the poor thing's as wet as he can be and don't you reckon it may be he's hungry true for you rachel i forgot so the old lady says betsy this was a nigger woman you fly around and get him something to eat as quick as you can poor thing and one of you girls go and wake up buck and tell him oh here he is himself buck take this little stranger and get the wet clothes off from him and dress him up in some of yours that's dry buck looked about as old as me thirteen or fourteen or along there though he was a little bigger than me he hadn't on anything but a shirt and he was very frowsy headed he came in gaping and digging one fist into his eyes and he was dragging a gun along with the other one he says ain't they no shepherdsons around they say no twas a false alarm well he says if they'd a been some i reckon i'd a got one they all laughed and bob says why buck they might have scalped us all you've been so slow in coming well nobody come after me and it ain't right i'm always kept down i don't get no show never mind buck my boy says the old man you'll have show enough all in good time don't you fret about that go long with you now and do as your mother told you when we got upstairs to his room he got me a coarse shirt and a roundabout and pants of his and i put them on while i was at it he asked me what my name was but before i could tell him he started to tell me about a blue jay and a young rabbit he had catched in the woods day before yesterday and he asked me where moses was when the candle went out i said i didn't know i hadn't heard about it before no way well guess he says how am i going to guess says i when i never heard tell of it before but you can guess can't you it's just as easy which candle i says why any candle he says i don't know where he was says i where was he why he was in the dark that's where he was well if you knowed where he was what did you ask me for why blame it it's a riddle don't you see say how long are you going to stay here you got to stay always we can just have booming times they don't have no school now do you own a dog i've got a dog and he'll go in the river and bring out chips that you throw in do you like to comb up sundays and all that kind of foolishness you bet i don't but ma she makes me confound these old breeches i reckon i'd better put em on but i'd rather not it's so warm are you all ready all right come along old hoss cold corn pone cold corn beef butter and buttermilk that is what they had for me down there and there ain't nothin better that ever i've come across yet buck and his ma and all of them smoked cob pipes except the nigger woman which was gone and the two young women they all smoked and talked and i eat and talked the young women had quilts around them and their hair down their backs they all asked me questions and i told them how pap and me and all the family was living on a little farm down at the bottom of arkansas and my sister mary ann run off and got married and never was heard of no more and bill went to hunt them and he warn't heard of no more and tom and mort died and then there warn't nobody but just me and pap left and he was just trimmed down to nothing on account of his troubles so when he died i took what there was left 
because the farm didn't belong to us and started up the river deck passage and fell overboard and that was how i come to be here so they said i could have a home there as long as i wanted it then it was most daylight and everybody went to bed and i went to bed with buck and when i waked up in the morning drat it all i had forgot what my name was so i laid there about an hour trying to think and when buck waked up i says can you spell buck yes he says i bet you can't spell my name says i i bet you what you dare i can says he all right says i go ahead g e o r g e j a x o n there now he says well says i you done it but i didn't think you could it ain't no slouch of a name to spell right off without studying i set it down private because somebody might want me to spell it next and so i wanted to be handy with it and rattle it off like i was used to it it was a mighty nice family and a mighty nice house too i hadn't seen no house out in the country before that was so nice and had so much style it didn't have an iron latch on the front door nor a wooden one with a buckskin string but a brass knob to turn the same as houses in town there weren't no bed in the parlor nor a sign of a bed but heaps of parlors in towns has beds in them there was a big fireplace that was bricked on the bottom and the bricks was kept clean and red by pouring water on them and scrubbing them with another brick sometimes they washed them over with red water paint that they call spanish brown same as they do in town they had big brass dog irons that could hold up a saw log there was a clock on the middle of the mantelpiece with a picture of a town painted on the bottom half of the glass front and a round place in the middle of it for the sun and you could see the pendulum swinging behind it it was beautiful to hear that clock tick and sometimes when one of these peddlers had been along and scoured her up and got her in good shape she would start in and strike a hundred and fifty before she got tuckered out they wouldn't took any money for her well there was a big outlandish parrot on each side of the clock made out of something like chalk and painted up gaudy by one of the parrots was a cat made of crockery and a crockery dog by the other and when you pressed down on them they squeaked but didn't open their mouths nor look different nor interested they squeaked through underneath there was a couple of big wild turkey wing fans spread out behind those things on the table in the middle of the room was a kind of a lovely crockery basket that had apples and oranges and peaches and grapes piled up in it which was much redder and yellower and prettier than real ones is but they weren't real because you could see where pieces had got chipped off and showed the white chalk or whatever it was underneath this table had a cover made out of beautiful oilcloth with a red and blue spread eagle painted on it and a painted border all around it come all the way from philadelphia they said there was some books too piled up to perfectly exact on each corner of the table one was a big family bible full of pictures one was pilgrim's progress about a man that left his family it didn't say why i read considerable in it now and then the statements was interesting but tough another was friendship's offering full of beautiful stuff and poetry but i didn't read the poetry another was henry clay's speeches and another was dr gunn's family medicine which told you all about what to do if a body was sick or dead there was a hymn book and a lot of other books and there was nice split-bottom chairs and perfectly sound too not bagged down in the middle and busted like an old basket they had pictures hung on the walls 
mainly washington's and lafayette's and battles and highland mary's and one called signing the declaration there was some that they called crayons which one of the daughters which was dead made her own self when she was only fifteen years old they was different from any pictures i ever see before blacker mostly than is common one was a woman in a slim black dress belted small under the armpits with bulges like a cabbage in the middle of the sleeves and a large black scoop shovel bonnet with a black veil and white slim ankles crossed about with black tape and very wee black slippers like a chisel and she was leaning pensive on a tombstone on her right elbow under a weeping willow and her other hand hanging down her side holding a white handkerchief and a reticule and underneath the picture it said shall i never see thee more alas another one was a young lady with her hair all combed up straight to the top of her head and knotted there in front of a comb like a chair back and she was crying into a handkerchief and had a dead bird laying on its back in her other hand with its heels up and underneath the picture it said i shall never hear thy sweet chirrup more alas there was one where a young lady was at a window looking up at the moon and tears running down her cheeks and she had an open letter in one hand with black sealing wax showing on one edge of it and she was mashing a locket with a chain to it against her mouth and underneath the picture it said and art thou gone yes thou art gone alas these was all nice pictures i reckon but i didn't somehow seem to take to them because if ever i was down a little they always give me the fantods everybody was sorry she died because she had laid out a lot more of these pictures to do and a body could see by what she had done what they had lost but i reckoned that with her disposition she was having a better time in the graveyard she was at work on what they said was her greatest picture when she took sick and every day and every night it was her prayer to be allowed to live till she got it done but she never got the chance it was a picture of a young woman in a long white gown standing on the rail of a bridge all ready to jump off with her hair all down her back and looking up to the moon with the tears running down her face and she had two arms folded across her breast and two arms stretched out in front and two more reaching up towards the moon and the idea was to see which pair would look best and then scratch out all the other arms but as i was saying she died before she got her mind made up and now they kept this picture over the head of the bed in her room and every time her birthday come they hung flowers on it other times it was hid with a little curtain the young woman in the picture had a kind of a nice sweet face but there was so many arms it made her look too spidery seemed to me this young girl kept a scrapbook when she was alive and used to paste obituaries and accidents and cases of patient suffering in it out of the presbyterian observer and write poetry after them out of her own head it was very good poetry this is what she wrote about a boy by the name of stephen dowling botts that fell down a well and was drowned ode to stephen dowling botts deceased and did young stephen sicken and did young stephen die and did the sad hearts thicken and did the mourners cry no such was not the fate of young stephen dowling botts though sad hearts round him thickened twas not from sickness's shots no whooping cough did rack his frame nor measles drear with spots not these impaired the sacred name of stephen dowling botts despised love struck not with woe that head of curly knots nor stomach troubles laid him low 
young stephen dowling botts oh no then list with tearful eye whilst i his fate do tell his soul did from this cold world fly by falling down a well they got him out and emptied him alas it was too late his spirit was gone for to sport aloft in the realms of the good and great if emmeline granger ford could make poetry like that before she was fourteen there ain't no telling what she could a done by and by buck said she could rattle off poetry like nothing she didn't ever have to stop to think he said she would slap down a line and if she couldn't find anything to rhyme with it would just scratch it out and slap down another one and go ahead she weren't particular she could write about anything you choose to give her to write about just so it was sadful every time a man died or a woman died or a child died she would be on hand with her tribute before he was cold she called them tributes the neighbors said it was the doctor first then emmeline then the undertaker the undertaker never got in ahead of emmeline but once and then she hung fire on a rhyme for the dead person's name which was whistler she weren't ever the same after that she never complained but she kinder pined away and did not live long poor thing many's the time i made myself go up to the little room that used to be hers and get out her poor old scrapbook and read in it when her pictures had been aggravating me and i had soured on her a little i liked all that family dead ones and all and weren't going to let anything come between us poor emmeline made poetry about all the dead people when she was alive and it didn't seem right that there weren't nobody to make some about her now she was gone so i tried to sweat out a verse or two myself but i couldn't seem to make it go somehow they kept emmeline's room trim and nice and all the things fixed in it just the way she liked to have them when she was alive and nobody ever slept there the old lady took care of the room herself though there was plenty of niggers and she sewed there a good deal and read her bible there mostly well as i was saying about the parlor there was beautiful curtains on the windows white with pictures painted on them of castles with vines all down the walls and cattle coming down to drink there was a little old piano too that had tin pans in it i reckon and nothing was ever so lovely as to hear the young ladies sing the last link is broken and play the battle of prague on it the walls of all the rooms was plastered and most had carpets on the floors and the whole house was whitewashed on the outside it was a double house and the big open place betwixt them was roofed and floored and sometimes the table was set there in the middle of the day and it was a cool comfortable place nothing couldn't be better and weren't the cooking good and just bushels of it too end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the adventures of huckleberry finn this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter eighteen colonel grangerford was a gentleman you see he was a gentleman all over and so was his family he was well born as the saying is and that's worth as much in a man as it is in a horse so the widow douglas said and nobody ever denied that she was of the first aristocracy in our town and pap he always said it too though he weren't no more quality than a mudcat himself colonel grangerford was very tall and very slim and had a darkish paley complexion not a sign of red in it anywheres 
he was clean shaved every morning all over his thin face and he had the thinnest kind of lips and the thinnest kind of nostrils and a high nose and heavy eyebrows and the blackest kind of eyes sunk so deep back that they seemed like they was looking out of caverns at you as you may say his forehead was high and his hair was black and straight and hung to his shoulders his hands was long and thin and every day of his life he put on a clean shirt and a full suit from head to toe made out of linen so white it hurt your eyes to look at it and on sundays he wore a blue tailcoat with brass buttons on it he carried a mahogany cane with a silver head to it there weren't no frivolishness about him not a bit and he warn't ever loud he was as kind as he could be you could feel that you know and so you had confidence sometimes he smiled and it was good to see but when he straightened himself up like a liberty pole and the lightning began to flicker out from under his eyebrows you wanted to climb a tree first and find out what the matter was afterwards he didn't ever have to tell anybody to mind their manners everybody was always good-mannered where he was everybody loved to have him around too he was sunshine most always i mean he made it seem like good weather when he turned into a cloud bank it was awful dark for half a minute and that was enough there wouldn't nothing go wrong again for a week when him and the old lady came down in the morning all the family got up out of their chairs and gave them good day and didn't set down again till they had set down then tom and bob went to the sideboard where the decanter was and mixed a glass of bitters and handed it to him and he held it in his hand and waited till tom's and bob's was mixed and then they bowed and said our duty to you sir and madam and they bowed the least bit in the world and said thank you and so they drank all three and bob and tom poured a spoonful of water on the sugar and the mite of whiskey or apple brandy in the bottom of their tumblers and give it to me and buck and we drank to the old people too bob was the oldest and tom next tall beautiful men with very broad shoulders and brown faces and long black hair and black eyes they dressed in white linen from head to foot like the old gentleman and wore broad panama hats then there was miss charlotte she was twenty-five and tall and proud and grand but as good as she could be when she weren't stirred up but when she was she had a look that would make you wilt in your tracks like her father she was beautiful so was her sister miss sophia but it was a different kind she was gentle and sweet like a dove and she was only twenty each person had their own nigger to wait on them buck too my nigger had a monstrous easy time because i weren't used to having anybody do anything for me but bucks was on the jump most of the time this was all there was of the family now but there used to be more three sons they got killed and emmeline that died the old gentleman owned a lot of farms and over a hundred niggers sometimes a stack of people would come there horseback from ten or fifteen mile around and stay five or six days and have such junketings round about and on the river and dances and picnics in the woods daytimes and balls at the house nights these people was mostly kinfolks of the family the men brought their guns with them it was a handsome lot of quality i tell you there was another clan of aristocracy around there five or six families mostly of the name of shepherdson they was as high-toned and well-born and rich and grand as the tribe of grangerfords 
the shepherdsons and grangerfords used the same steamboat landing which was about two mile above our house so sometimes when i went up there with a lot of our folks i used to see a lot of the shepherdsons there on their fine horses one day buck and me was away out in the woods hunting and heard a horse coming we was crossing the road buck says quick jump for the woods we done it and then peeped down the woods through the leaves pretty soon a splendid young man come galloping down the road setting his horse easy and looking like a soldier he had his gun across his pommel i had seen him before it was young harney shepherdson i heard buck's gun go off at my ear and harney's hat tumbled off from his head he grabbed his gun and rode straight to the place where we was hid but we didn't wait we started through the woods on a run the woods weren't thick so i looked over my shoulder to dodge the bullet and twice i seen harney cover buck with his gun and then he rode away the way he come to get his hat i reckon but i couldn't see we never stopped running till we got home the old gentleman's eyes blazed a minute twas pleasure mainly i judged then his face sort of smoothed down and he says kind of gentle i don't like that shooting from behind a bush why didn't you step into the road my boy the shepherdsons don't father they always take advantage miss charlotte she held her head up like a queen while buck was telling his tale and her nostrils spread and her eyes snapped the two young men looked dark but never said nothing miss sophia she turned pale but the color come back when she found the man weren't hurt soon as i could get buck down by the corn cribs under the trees by ourselves i says did you want to kill him buck well i bet i did what did he do to you him he never done nothing to me well then what did you want to kill him for why nothing only it's on account of the feud what's a feud why where was you raised don't you know what a feud is never heard of it before tell me about it well says buck a feud is this way a man has a quarrel with another man and kills him then that other man's brother kills him then the other brothers on both sides goes for one another then the cousins chip in and by and by everybody's killed off and there ain't no more feud but it's kind of slow and takes a long time has this one been going on long buck well i should reckon it started thirty year ago or summers along there there was trouble about something and then a lawsuit to settle it and the suit went again one of the men and so he up and shot the man that won the suit which he would naturally do of course anybody would what was the trouble about buck land i reckon maybe i don't know well who done the shooting was it a grangerford or a shepherdson laws how do i know it was so long ago don't anybody know oh yes pa knows i reckon and some of the other old people but they don't know now what the row was about in the first place has there been many killed buck yes right smart chance of funerals but they don't always kill pa's got a few buckshot in him but he don't mind it cause he don't weigh much anyway bob's been carved up some with a bowie and tom's been hurt once or twice has anybody been killed this year buck yes we got one and they got one about three months ago my cousin bud fourteen year old was riding through the woods on the other side of the river and didn't have no weapon with him which was blame foolishness and in a lonesome place he hears a horse a-comin behind him and sees old baldy shepherdson a lincoln after him with his gun in his hand and his white hair a flyin in the wind and stead of jumpin off and taking to the brush bud loud he could outrun him so they had it nip and tuck for five mile or more 
the old man a gainin all the time so at last bud seen it warn't any use so he stopped and faced around so as to have the bullet holes in front you know and the old man he rode up and shot him down but he didn't get much chance to enjoy his luck for inside of a week our folks laid him out i reckon that old man was a coward buck i reckon he warn't a coward not by a blame sight there ain't a coward amongst them shepherdsons not a one and there ain't no cowards amongst the grangerfords either why that old man kep up his end in a fight one day for half an hour against three grangerfords and come out winner they was all a horseback he let off of his horse and got behind a little woodpile and kep his horse before him to stop the bullets but the grangerfords stayed on their horses and capered around the old man and peppered away at him and he peppered away at them him and his horse both went home pretty leaky and crippled but the grangerfords had to be fetched home and one of em was dead and another died the next day no sir if a body's out hunting for cowards he don't want to fool away any time amongst them shepherdsons because they don't breed any of that kind next sunday we all went to church about three mile everybody a horseback the men took their guns along so did buck and kept them between their knees or stood them handy against the wall the shepherdsons done the same it was pretty ornery preaching all about brotherly love and such like tiresomeness but everybody said it was a good sermon and they all talked it over going home and had such a powerful lot to say about faith and good works and free grace and pre for or destination and i don't know what all that it did seem to me to be one of the roughest sundays i had run across yet about an hour after dinner everybody was dozing around some in their chairs and some in their rooms and it got to be pretty dull buck and a dog was stretched out on the grass in the sun sound asleep i went up to our room and judged i would take a nap myself i found that sweet miss sophia standing in her door which was next to ours and she took me in her room and shut the door very soft and asked me if i liked her and i said i did and she asked me if i would do something for her and not tell anybody and i said i would then she said she'd forgot her testament and left it in the seat at church between two other books and would i slip out quiet and go there and fetch it to her and not say nothin to nobody i said i would so i slid out and slipped off up the road and there warn't anybody at the church except maybe a hog or two for there warn't any lock on the door and hogs likes a punchian floor in summer time because it's cool if you notice most folks don't go to church only when they've got to but a hog is different says i to myself something's up it ain't natural for a girl to be in such a sweat about a testament so i give it a shake and out drops a little piece of paper with half past two wrote on it with a pencil i ransacked it but couldn't find anything else i couldn't make anything out of that so i put the paper in the book again and when i got home and upstairs there was miss sophia in her door waiting for me she pulled me in and shut the door then she looked in the testament till she found the paper and as soon as she read it she looked glad and before a body could think she grabbed me and gave me a squeeze and said i was the best boy in the world and not to tell anybody she was mighty red in the face for a minute and her eyes lighted up and it made her powerful pretty i was a good deal astonished but when i got my breath i asked her what the paper was about and she asked me if i had read it and i said no 
and she asked me if i could read writing and i told her no only coarse hand and then she said the paper warn't anything but a bookmark to keep her place and i might go and play now i went off down to the river studying over this thing and pretty soon i noticed that my nigger was following along behind when we was out of sight of the house he looked back and around a second and then comes a running and says mars charge if you'll come down into the swamp i'll show you a whole stack of water moccasins thinks i that's mighty curious he said that yesterday he oughter know a body don't love water moccasins enough to go around hunting for them what is he up to anyway so i says all right trot ahead i followed a half a mile then he struck out over the swamp and waded ankle-deep as much as another half mile we come to a little flat piece of land which was dry and very thick with trees and bushes and vines and he says you shove right in dere just a few steps mars jarge das where dey is i seed em befo' i don't care to see em no mo then he slopped right along and went away and pretty soon the trees hid him i poked into the place a ways and come to a little open patch as big as a bedroom all hung around with vines and found a man lying there asleep and by jings it was my old jim i waked him up and i reckoned it was going to be a grand surprise to him to see me again but it warn't he nearly cried he was so glad but he warn't surprised said he swum along behind me that night and heard me yell every time but dasn't answer because he didn't want nobody to pick him up and take him into slavery again says he i got hurt a little and couldn't swim fast so i was a considerable ways behind you towards de lass when you landed i reckoned i could catch up with you on de land doubt havin to shout at you but when i see dat house i begin to go slow i was off too fur to hear what dey say to you i was fraid of de dogs but when it was all quiet again i knowed you's in de house so i struck out for de woods to wait for day early in de mornin some ar de niggers come along gwine to de fields and dey tuck me and showed me dis place where de dogs can't track me on accounts of de water and dey brings me truck to eat every night and tells me how you's a gettin along why didn't you tell my jack to fetch me here sooner jim well twarn't no use to sturb you huck till we could do somethin but we's all right now i been a buyin pots and pans and vittles and i got a chance and a patchin up de raff nights when what raff jim our old raff you mean to say our old raft warn't smashed all to flinders no she warn't she was tore up a good deal one end of her was but dey warn't no great harm done only our traps was most all loss if we hadn't dived so deep and swum so far under water and de night hadn't been so dark and we warn't so skired and been sich punkin heads as de sayin is we'd a seed de raff but it's just as well we didn't cause now she's all fixed up again most as good as new and we's got a new lot of stuff in de place of what was lost why how did you get hold of the raft again jim did you catch her how i gwine to catch her and i out in de woods no some other niggers found her catched on a snag along here in de ben and dey hid her in a crick mongst de willows and dey was so much john about which unum she belonged to de most dat i come to hear bout it pretty soon so i ups and settles de trouble by tellin em she don't belong to none of em but to you and me and i asked em if they gwine to grab a young white gentleman's property and get a hidden for it den i gin em ten cents apiece and they was mighty well satisfied 
and wished some more rafts would come along and make em rich again dey's mighty good to me dese niggers is and whatever i wants em to do for me i don't have to ask em twice honey dat jack's a good nigger and pooty smart yes he is he ain't ever told me you was here told me to come and he'd show me a lot of water moccasins if anything happens he ain't mixed up in it he can say he never seen us together and it'll be the truth i don't want to talk much about the next day i reckon i'll cut it pretty short i waked up about dawn and was a-goin to turn over and go to sleep again when i noticed how still it was didn't seem to be anybody stirring that warn't usual next i noticed that buck was up and gone well i gets up a wondering and goes downstairs nobody around everything as still as a mouse just the same outside thinks i what does it mean down by the woodpile i comes across my jack and says what's it all about says he don't you know mars george no says i i don't well den miss sophia's run off deed she has she's run off in de night some time nobody don't know just when run off to get married to that young harney shepherdson you know leastwise so they spec de fambly found it out about half an hour ago maybe a little mo and i tell you dey warn't no time loss sich another hurrying up guns and hosses you never see de woman folks has gone for to stir up de relations and old mars sol and de boys tuck de guns and rode up the river road for to try to catch that young man and kill him for he can get across the river with miss sophia i reckon days gwine to be mighty rough times buck went off thout waking me up well i reckon he did de warn gwine to mix you up in it mars buck he loaded up his gun and loud he's gwine to fetch home a shepherdson or bust well there'll be plenty of em da i reckon and you bet you he'll fetch one if he gets a chance i took up the river road as hard as i could put by and by i begin to hear guns a good ways off when i come in sight of the log store and the woodpile where the steamboats lands i worked along under the trees and brush till i got to a good place and then i clum up into the forks of a cottonwood that was out of reach and watched there was a wood rank four foot high a little ways in front of the tree and first i was going to hide behind that but maybe it was luckier i didn't there was four or five men cavorting around on their horses in the open place before the log store cussing and yelling and trying to get at a couple of young chaps that was behind the wood rank alongside of the steamboat landing but they couldn't come it every time one of them showed himself on the riverside of the woodpile he got shot at the two boys was squatting back to back behind the pile so they could watch both ways by and by the men stopped cavorting around and yelling they started riding towards the store then up gets one of the boys draws a steady bead over the wood rank and drops one of them out of his saddle all the men jumped off of their horses and grabbed the hurt one and started to carry him to the store and that minute the two boys started on the run they got halfway to the tree i was in before the men noticed then the men see them and jumped on their horses and took out after them they gained on the boys but it didn't do no good the boys had too good a start they got to the woodpile that was in front of my tree and slipped in behind it and so they had the bulge on the men again one of the boys was buck and the other was a slim young chap about nineteen years old the men ripped around a while and then rode away as soon as they was out of sight i sung out to buck and told him he didn't know what to make of my voice coming out of the tree at first he was awful surprised he told me to watch out sharp and let him know when the men come in sight again 
said they was up to some devilment or other, wouldn't be gone long. I wished I was out of that tree, but I dasn't come down. Buck begun to cry and rip, and loud that him and his cousin Joe, that was the other young chap, would make up for this day yet. He said his father and his two brothers was killed, and two or three of the enemy. Said the Shepherdsons, laid for them in ambush. Buck said his father and brothers ought to wait it for their relations. The Shepherdsons was too strong for them. I asked him what was become of young Harney and Miss Sophia. He said they got across the river and was safe. I was glad of that. But the way Buck did take on because he didn't manage to kill Harney that day, he shot at him. I hain't ever heard anything like it. All of a sudden, bang, 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 goes three or four guns. The men had slipped around through the woods and come in from behind without their horses. The boys jumped for the river, both of them hurt, and as they swum down the current, the men run along the bank shooting at them and singing out kill them kill them it made me so sick i almost fell out of the tree i ain't a goin to tell all that happened it would make me sick again if i was to do that i wished i hadn't ever come ashore that night to see such things i ain't ever goin to get shut of them lots of times i dream about them i stayed in the tree till it begun to get dark afraid to come down. Sometimes I heard guns away off in the woods, and twice I seen little gangs of men gallop past the log store with guns, so I reckoned the trouble was still a-goin' on. I was mighty downhearted, so I made up my mind I wouldn't ever go a near that house again, because I reckoned I was to blame somehow. I judged that that piece of paper meant that Miss Sophia was to meet Harney somewheres at half-past two and run off, and I judged I ought to told her father about that paper and the curious way she acted, and then maybe he would a locked her up and this awful mess wouldn't ever happened. When I got down out of the tree, I crept along down the river bank a piece and found the two bodies laying in the edge of the water and tugged at them till I got them ashore. Then I covered up their faces and got away as quick as I could. I cried a little when I was covering up Buck's face, for he was mighty good to me. It was just dark now. I never went near the house, but struck through the woods and made for the swamp. Jim weren't on his island, so I tramped off in a hurry for the crick and crowded through the willows, red hot to jump aboard and get out of that awful country the raft was gone my souls but i was scared i couldn't get my breath for most a minute then i raised a yell a voice not twenty-five foot from me says good land is that you honey don't make no noise it was jim's voice nothing ever sounded so good before i run along the bank a piece and got aboard and Jim, he grabbed me and hugged me. He was so glad to see me. He says, Laws, bless you, child. I was right down shore you's dead again. Jack's been here. He says he reckon you's been shot, cause you didn't come home no more. So I's just dis minute a startin' de raft down towards de mouth of de creek, so's to be all ready for to shove out and leave soon as Jack comes again and tells me for certain you is dead. Lazy, I's mighty glad to get you back again, honey. I says, all right, that's mighty good. They won't find me, and they'll think I've been killed and floated down the river. There's something up there that'll help them think so. So don't you lose no time, Jim. Just shove off for the big water as fast as ever you can. I never felt easy till the raft was two mile below there, and out in the middle of the Mississippi. Then we hung up our signal lantern and judged that we was free and safe once more. I hadn't had a bite to eat since yesterday, so Jim, he got out some corn dodgers and buttermilk and pork and cabbage and greens. There ain't nothing in the world so good when it's cooked right, 
and whilst i eat my supper we talked and had a good time i was powerful glad to get away from the feuds and so was jim to get away from the swamp we said there warn't no home like a raft after all other places do seem so cramped up and smothery but a raft don't you feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the adventures of huckleberry finn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by florence short the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter nineteen two or three days and nights went by i reckon i might say they swum by they slid along so quiet and smooth and lovely here is the way we put in the time it was a monstrous big river down there sometimes a mile and a half wide we run nights and laid up and hid daytimes soon as night was most gone we stopped navigating and tied up nearly always in the dead water under a towhead and then cut young cottonwoods and willows and hid the raft with them then we set out the lines next we slid into the river and had a swim so as to freshen up and cool off then we sat down on the sandy bottom where the water was about knee-deep and watched the daylight come not a sound anywheres perfectly still just like the whole world was asleep only sometimes the bullfrogs are cluttering maybe the first thing to see looking away over the water was a kind of dull line that was the woods on t'other side you couldn't make nothing else out then a pale place in the sky then more paleness spreading around then the river softened up away off and weren't black any more but gray you could see little dark spots drifting along ever so far away trading scows and such things and long black streaks rafts sometimes you could hear a sweet screeching or jumbled up voices it was so still and sounds come so far and by and by you could see a streak on the water which you know by the look of the streak that there's a snag there in the swift current which breaks on it and makes that streak look that way and you see the mist curl up off of the water and the east reddens up in the river and you make out a log cabin on the edge of the woods away on the bank on t'other side of the river being a woodyard likely and piled by them cheats so you can throw a dog through it anywheres then the nice breeze springs up and comes fanning you from over there so cool and fresh and sweet to smell on account of the woods and the flowers but sometimes not that way because they've left dead fish laying around gars and such and they do get pretty rank and next you've got the full day and everything's smiling in the sun and the songbirds just going it a little smoke couldn't be noticed now so we would take some fish off of the lines and cook up a hot breakfast and afterwards we would watch the lonesomeness of the river and kind of lazy along and by and by lazy off to sleep wake up by and by and look to see what done it and maybe see a steamboat coughing along upstream so far off towards the other side you couldn't tell nothing about her only whether she was a stern wheel or side wheel then for about an hour there wouldn't be nothing to hear nor nothing to see just solid lonesomeness next you'd see a raft sliding by away off yonder and maybe a galoot on it chopping because they're most always doing it on a raft you'd see the axe flash and come down you don't hear nothing you see that axe go up again and by the time it's above the man's head then you hear the ka chunk 
it had took all that time to come over the water so we would put in the day lazying around listening to the stillness once there was a thick fog and the rafts and things that went by was beaten tin pans so the steamboats wouldn't run over them a scow or a raft went by so close we could hear them talking and cussing and laughing heard them plain but we couldn't see no sign of them it made you feel crawly it was like spirits carrying on that way in the air jim said he believed it was spirits but i says no spirits wouldn't say durn the durn fog soon as it was night out we shoved when we got her out to about the middle we let her alone and let her float wherever the current wanted her to then we lit the pipes and dangled our legs in the water and talked about all kinds of things we was always naked day and night whenever the mosquitoes would let us the new clothes buck's folks made for me was too good to be comfortable and besides i didn't go much on clothes no how sometimes we'd have the whole river all to ourselves for the longest time yonder was the banks and the islands across the water and maybe a spark which was a candle in a cabin window and sometimes on the water you could see a spark or two on a raft or a scow you know and maybe you could hear a fiddle or a song coming over from one of them crafts it's lovely to live on a raft we had the sky up there all speckled with stars and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened jim he allowed they was made but i allowed they happened i judged it would have took too long to make so many jim said the moon could a laid them well that looked kind of reasonable so i didn't say nothing against it because i've seen a frog lay most as many so of course it could be done we used to watch the stars that fell too and we'd see them streak down jim allowed they'd got spoiled and was hove out of the nest once or twice of a night we would see a steamboat slipping along in the dark and now and then she would belch a whole world of sparks up out of her chimbleys and they would rain down in the river and look awful pretty then she would turn a corner and her lights would wink out and her powwow shut off and leave the river still again and by and by her waves would get to us a long time after she was gone and joggle the raft a bit and after that you wouldn't hear nothing for you couldn't tell how long except maybe frogs or something after midnight the people on shore went to bed and then for two or three hours the shores was black no more sparks in the cabin windows these sparks was our clock the first one that showed again meant morning was coming so we hunted a place to hide and tie up right away one morning about daybreak i found a canoe and crossed over a chute to the main shore it was only two hundred yards and paddled about a mile up a creek amongst the cypress woods to see if i couldn't get some berries just as i was passing a place where a kind of a cow path crossed the creek here comes a couple of men tearing up the path as tight as they could foot it i thought i was a goner for whenever anybody was after anybody i judged it was me or maybe jim i was about to dig out from there in a hurry but they was pretty close to me then and sung out and begged me to save their lives said they hadn't been doing nothing and was being chased for it said there was men and dogs a-coming they wanted to jump right in but i says 
Don't you do it. I don't hear the dogs and horses yet. You've got time to crowd through the brush and get up the creek a little ways. Then you take to the water and wade down to me and get in. That'll throw the dogs off the scent. They done it. And soon as they was aboard, I lit out for our towhead. And in about five or ten minutes, we heard the dogs and the men away off shouting. We heard them come along towards the creek, but couldn't see them. They seemed to stop and fool around a while. Then, as we got further and further away all the time, we couldn't hardly hear them at all. By the time we had left a mile of woods behind us and struck the river, everything was quiet, and we paddled over to the towhead and hid in the cottonwoods and was safe. One of these fellows was about seventy or upwards and had a bald head and very gray whiskers. He had an old battered-up slouch hat on and a greasy blue woolen shirt and ragged old blue jeans rich stuffed into his boot tops and home-knit galoses. No, he only had one. He had an old long-tailed blue jeans coat with slick brass buttons flung over his arm, and both of them had big, fat, ratty-looking carpet bags. The other fellow was about thirty and dressed about as ornery. After breakfast, we all laid off and talked, and the first thing that come out was that these chaps didn't know one another. What got you into trouble? says the bald head to other chaps. Well, I've been selling an article to take the tartar off the teeth, and it does take it off, too, and generally the enamel along with it. But I stayed about one night longer than I ought to, and was just in the act of sliding out when I ran across you on the trail this side of town. And you told me they were coming, and begged me to help you to get off. So I told you I was expecting trouble myself, and would scatter out with you. That's the whole yarn. What's yours? Well, I've been running a little temperance revival there about a week, and was the pet of the women folks, big and little, for I was making it mighty warm for the rummies. I tell you, and taking as much as five or six dollars a night, ten cents a head, children and niggers free, and business a growing all the time, when somehow or other a little report got around last night that I had a way of putting in my time with a private jug on the sly. A nigger rousted me out this morning and told me the people was gathering on the quiet with their dogs and horses and they'd be along pretty soon and give me about half an hour's start and then run me down if they could. And if they got me, they'd tire and feather me and ride me on a rail. Sure. I didn't wait for no breakfast. I weren't hungry. Oh, man, said the young one. I reckon we might double team it together. What do you think? I ain't undisposed. What's your line, mainly? Chore printer by trade, do a little in patent medicines. Theater, actor, tragedy, you know. Take a turn to mesmerism and phrenology when there's a chance. Teach singing, geography school for a change. Sling a lecture sometimes. Oh, I do lots of things. Most anything that comes handy, so it ain't work. What's your lay? I've done considerable in the doctoring way in my time. Laying on a hands is my best holt for cancer and paralysis and sich things. And I can tell a fortune pretty good when I've got somebody along to find out the facts for me. Preaching's my line, too, and work in camp meetings. And missionarying around. Nobody never said anything for a while. Then the young man hove a sigh and says, 
Alas, what are you a lassin' about? says the bald head. To think I should have lived to be leading such a life and to be degraded down into such company. And he began to wipe the corner of his eye with a rag. Turn your skin. Ain't the company good enough for you? says the bald head, pretty pert and uppish. Yes, it is good enough for me. It's as good as I deserve, for who fetched me so low when I was so high? I did myself. I don't blame you, gentlemen. Far from it. I don't blame anybody. I deserve it all. Let the cold world do its worst. One thing I know. There's a grave somewhere for me. The world may go on just as it's always done and take everything from me loved ones property everything but it can't take that some day i'll lie down in it and forget it all and my poor broken heart will be at rest he went on a wiping drop your poor broken heart says the bald head what are you heaving your poor broken heart at us for we hain't done nothing no i know you haven't I ain't blaming you, gentlemen. I brought myself down. Yes, I did it myself. It's right I should suffer. Perfectly right. I don't make any moan. Brought you down from where? Where was you brought down from? Ah, you would not believe me. The world never believes. Let it pass. Tis no matter. The secret of my birth the secret of your birth do you mean to say gentlemen says the young man very solemn i will reveal it to you for i feel i may have confidence in you by rights i am a duke jim's eyes bugged out when he heard that and i reckon mine did too then the bald head says no you can't mean it yes my great-grandfather eldest son of the duke of bridgewater fled to this country about the end of the last century to breathe the pure air of freedom married here and died leaving a son his own father dying about the same time the second son of the late duke seized the titles and estates the infant real duke was ignored i am the lineal descendant of that infant i am the rightful duke of bridgewater and here i am forlorn torn from my high estate hunted of men despised by the cold world ragged worn heartbroken and degraded to the companionship of felons on a raft jim pitied him ever so much and so did i we tried to comfort him but he said it warn't much use he couldn't be much comforted said if we was a mind to acknowledge him that would do him more good than most anything else so we said we would if he would tell us how he said we ought to bow when we spoke to him and say your grace or my lord or your lordship and he wouldn't mind it if we called him plain bridgewater which he said was a title anyway and not a name and one of us ought to wait on him at dinner and do any little thing for him he wanted done well that was all easy so we done it all through dinner jim stood around and waited on him and says will you grace have some of this or some of that and so on and a body could see it was mighty pleasing to him but the old man got pretty silent by and by didn't have much to say and didn't look pretty comfortable over all that petting that was going on round the duke he seemed to have something on his mind so along in the afternoon he says look at here bilgewater he says i'm nation sorry for you but you ain't the only person that's had troubles like that 
No. No, you ain't. You ain't the only person that's been snaked down wrongfully out in a high place. Alas! No, you ain't the only person that's had a secret of his birth. And by jinx, he begins to cry. Hold! What do you mean? Bilgewater, can I trust you? Says the old man, still sort of sobbing to the bitter death he took the old man by the hand and squeezed it and says that secret of your being speak bilge water i am the late dauphin you bet you jim and me stared this time then the duke says you are what yes my friend it is too true your eyes is looking at this very moment on the poor disappeared dauphin louis the seventeen son of louis the sixteen and mary antoinette you at your age no you mean you're the late charlemagne you must be six or seven hundred years old at the very least trouble has done it bilgewater trouble has brung these gray hairs in this premature balditude yes gentlemen you see before you in blue jeans and misery the wandering exiled trampled on and suffering rightful king of france well he cried and took on so that me and jim didn't know hardly what to do we was so sorry and so glad and proud we got him with us too so we set in like we done before with the duke and tried to comfort him but he said it weren't no use nothing but to be dead and done with it all could do him any good though he said it often made him feel easier and better for a while if people treated him according to his rights and got down on one knee to speak to him and always called him your majesty and waited on him first at meals and didn't sit down in his presence till he asked them so jim and me set to majestying him and doing this and that and t'other for him and standing up till he told us we might sit down this done him heaps of good and so he got cheerful and comfortable but the duke kind of soured on him and didn't look a bit satisfied with the way things was going still the king acted real friendly towards him and said the duke's great-grandfather and all the other dukes of bilgewater was a good deal thought of by his father and was allowed to come to the palace considerable but the duke stayed huffy a good while till by and by the king says i guess not we got to be together a blame long time on this he here wrath bilgewater and so what's the use o your being sour it'll only make things uncomfortable it ain't my fault i weren't born a duke it ain't your fault you weren't born a king so what's the use to worry make the best of things the way you find em says i that's my motto this ain't no bad thing that we've struck here plenty grub and an easy life come give us your hand duke and let's all be friends the duke done it and jim and me was pretty glad to see it it took away all the uncomfortableness and we felt mighty good over it because it would have been a miserable business to have any unfriendliness on the raft for what you want above all things on a raft is for everybody to be satisfied and feel right and kind towards the others it didn't take me long to make up my mind that these liars weren't no kings nor dukes at all but just low-down humbugs and frauds but i never said nothing never let on kept it to myself it's the best way then you don't have no quarrels and don't get into no trouble if they wanted us to call them kings and dukes i hadn't no objections long as it would keep peace in the family 
and it weren't no use to tell Jim, so I didn't tell him. If I never learnt nothing else out of Pop, I learnt that the best way to get along with his kind of people is to let them have their own way. End of chapter 19